At one time or another, we've all experienced that wonderful feeling of falling in love. There's nothing like it. But the question is, did that love endure? Were we able to hold on to that wonderful feeling we had when we first fell in love? That seems to be a common problem uh, these days. It's something that's prevalent throughout our society and the way we relate to each other and certainly in the way we relate to the Lord. Think about this for a minute. When you sit and look at that person you love across the table from you, can you honestly say that you still feel the same way you did when you first met, when you first fell in love? And how does that relate to your relationship with Jesus? Is it the same as it was in the beginning when you first had that incredible feeling of coming to know him? That's what I want to talk a little bit about and more importantly about how do we prevent ourselves from losing that excitement, that feeling that we have in the very beginning. But before I do that, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Our gracious, loving, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, first of all, just for giving us the life that we have. And you have provided for us the ultimate example of what love is. And yet, Lord, somehow we seem to struggle with love. Maybe we have that at one point, and then Somehow it seems to fade over time. We lose that excitement. We lose that enthusiasm. Lord, help us to see today what it is we can do to avoid that. And if that has happened, Lord, help us that we can find our way back. Find our way back not only to you, which is most important, but also to those in our lives that maybe we have become somewhat disconnected from, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a a child, a, a, another family member. Lord, help us with that. Help us to see what we can do to stay on track with that excitement and that enthusiasm that we have when we first fall in love. We thank you for this. We praise you. I just pray for the words from on high that will help us all to be able to see clearly those things. For all of this, I pray in Jesus' holy and precious and wonderful name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> a number of years ago, I was asked to speak at a pastor's conference. And I remember at that time, I was really on fire. I was really excited just to talk about what I had found, my relationship with the Lord, and what he had done in my life. And I, I can't remember for the life of me what I said back then, but all I remember is after I spoke, I had a number of pastors come up to me and shake my hand. And I remember two in particular, because I'll never forget this, they had tears welling up in their eyes. And as they shook my hand, they each said the same thing. They said, I sure wish I can still feel the way you do. And I thought to myself, what? is wrong with that picture. It broke my heart, actually, because I thought, why would we not feel the same way? And then I began to realize, you know, it's that way sometimes in a marriage. It's that way in a marriage. You know, things start off great. Maybe we're head over heels in love with that person, as they say, head over heels in love. And then somehow, some way, that begins to wane. You know, maybe over time, you know, the repetition of the same stories, the same routines, the same ideas. We talk about the same things. Uh, maybe the bond over time begins to wear away somewhat. But the question is, not only why does this happen, but does it even have to happen? It seems to be a, a, a subject we all have a hard time with, maintaining that love not just for the ones in our lives, the special people in our lives, the ones that we love, but for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why is it that that love sometimes fades over time? It's not the same way it was in the beginning, that first love experience. But even before I get into that, I want to talk about love itself. What is love? 
what exactly is it? You know, in a biblical sense, it's, it's an action, it's a choice that goes beyond any feelings. It's not always about feelings, and sometimes it's even in spite of the feelings. You know, that's the interesting part. You know, the definition of love in the Bible, the best example we can find is in 1 Corinthians 13. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, the Bible says, <clears throat> Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, and rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whatever, wherever or whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But what? Love still endures, doesn't it? Love still endures. That's the whole point of this. Can we have that happen in our lives? Can we experience that? It's a choice that goes beyond the level of feelings. And Jesus expressed this in Matthew 5, <clears throat> verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Boy, that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? That if we have people that really don't like us, and we, somehow we still need to feel love for them. Well, Lord loves all of us, regardless of what has happened or what we've done in our lives, we're all his children. And we forget that sometimes, that, that becomes so difficult. You know, this is where we, this is an example of where we love in spite of our feelings. I mean, you know, nobody likes to be the target of somebody's hatred, uh, none of us do. But how do we handle it? Love them? It seems like a, a paradox, doesn't it? So what does this have to do with that wonderful feeling that we get when we first fall in love? You know, I remember my experience when I first accepted Jesus into my life and the excitement that I had, the enthusiasm and the tears running down my, from my eyes. And it was a wonderful experience. And I know a lot of us can relate to that. And I won't mention any names, but in my case, I was actually watching a very well-known televangelist on a TV program. I had gone through some very painful experiences in my life at that time, and I was looking for answers. And I just happened to turn on the TV, and why? Not to look for that. I turned on the TV to try to blank out, to look at some mindless material and forget all my worries and my cares like most people do. But I just happened to catch this one message that somehow at that time just resonated with me. It, it just did something. And, uh, it was maybe the gospel was presented in a way I'd never heard before. And because of that, something happened, something changed in my heart. And I really, really wanted that relationship with Jesus. It was quite a, quite a change. You know, I broke down, I dropped to my knees. Uh, I actually cried hysterically like a baby, like sometimes we do when we have that initial excitement of coming to know Jesus. It was the first love experience in full bloom. It truly was. I started going back to church. I started reading my Bible. Uh, but then what happened was things began to get busy. Challenges came up. My life started changing and I had more and more to deal with. And little by little, that incredible attraction, that first love experience began to fade. It just began to fade. You see, I thought I'd fallen in love with Jesus, but in reality, I didn't know him. I really didn't know him. I didn't have a faith that was grounded in the truth of his word. And for many of us, that may be the case. You know, do we really know him? You know, it's like the scenario in my case that the Lord described in the parable of the sower. And that's in Mark chapter four. Uh, these verses are so profound. I always look at this and think, wow, this describes me certainly a part of this does or the way I was at that time. Uh, beginning in verse 3, the Bible says, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, 
and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. <clears throat> and indeed, that was certainly a good, an apt description of what I uh, experienced at that point in my life. You know, the Bible goes on to say in verses 14 through 19, the description of this, what it's all about, the sower soweth the word, verse 14. And uh, beginning verse 15, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. <clears throat> and indeed, that's something that happens to a lot of us. And it goes on in verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and here it comes, folks, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And again, that was my own experience. My life got busy. I got into other things. I was tied up in the world. And because of that, little by little, it just, any excitement and enthusiasm I had was just choked away. It was, it was gone. And uh, that is a struggle I think many of us have uh, in the world today. You know, I endured for a time, but it didn't last. And that happens to so many people. Uh, what, what, how did that get, how did, how was that characterized? Well, I stopped reading my Bible. I stopped going to the church. And I wasn't praying all the time like I was before. You know, for me, it took years of hard knocks and a lot of trials and tribulation to find my way back. And I did find my way back, but I'll tell you, this doesn't happen with many people because when they turn away from the Lord, they turn away for good. And we don't want to see that happen to anyway, anyone. You know, it's the same reason, unfortunately, too, that people turn away from their spouse in a marriage. And that's something that's really prevalent today, too. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself there. We'll get, we'll get to that in a little bit. You know, in the book of Revelation, the church of Ephesus, which also symbolically represents the first period of the Christian era, was admonished about losing its first love. And we find that in the Bible in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, <clears throat> These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not, <coughs> excuse me, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So what exactly happened in those days to the early church? You know, the, the period represented by Ephesus was from 31 A.D. to, uh, to 100 A.D., and that was the period of uh, the emperors uh, Di uh, 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 Nero, Caligula, and Domitian. Uh, someone should, uh, I think a lot of us should probably know those names as going down as in infamy in, in the history books. You know, you'd certainly think that standing their ground in faith during a time when there was such extreme persecution that they had to face that all the time would somehow have brought them closer to the Lord. That's what we would think, but that's not how it went at all. Ellen White describes that very well in uh, Bible, this is from Bible Commentary, Volume 7. <coughs> <coughs> Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. 
Thine is a decay, a declension in holy zeal. Not forsaken is the object of it, but lost is the fervor. The first affection of the convert to Christ is deep, full, and ardent. It is not necessarily that this love should become less as knowledge increases, as the more, as the more an increased light shines upon him. That love should become more fervent as he becomes better acquainted with his Lord. It goes on to say, God will accept nothing less than the whole heart. Happy are they who from the commencement of their religious life have been true to their first love, growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sure result of their intercourse and fellowship with their beloved Lord will be to increase their piety, their purity, and their fervor. They are receiving a divine education, and this is illustrated in a life of fervor, of diligence, and zeal. It is our work to know our special failings and sins which cause darkness and spiritual feebleness and quenched our first love. But again, oddly enough, many in the church of Ephesus left their first love and stopped doing the first works as described in the verses that we looked at earlier. How did this happen? How could it happen when you consider what they were experiencing back at that time? Well, it goes on, and this is from Bible Commentary, again, Volume 7. Uh, this church had been highly favored, referring, of course, to the uh, church of Ephesus. It was planted by the Apostle Paul. In the same city was the Temple of Diana, which in point of grandeur was one of the marvels of the world. The Ephesian church met with great opposition. And some of the early Christians suffered persecution, and yet some of these very ones turned from the truths that had united them with Christ's followers and adopted in their stead the specious errors devised by Satan. This change is represented as a spiritual fall. Remember, therefore, for whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, as outlined in the preceding verses. The believers did not sense their spiritual fall. They knew not that a change had taken place in their hearts and that they would have to repent because of the non-continuance of their first works. But God, in his mercy, called for repentance, for a return to their first love and to the works that are always the result of true Christ-like love. Friends, this is the story of the children of Israel. And sadly, it's a story that belongs to many of us today, even in our church and individually. You know, I mentioned earlier about my own struggle with faith, you know, after going through severe trials and then, and then falling back in love with, with Jesus. But then when the trials, you know, when they loomed up again, that's when I lost that. I, I, I lost that, that first love. And I went back to what? To the ways of the world. I wasn't doing the, the first works. I wasn't doing what I originally started out doing because I, I just didn't have that enthusiasm, that fervor anymore. In other words, letting go of the first works, if you can call it that in my case, uh, back, way back then, uh, you know, that is going to church, maybe having fellowship, reading the Bible, having prayer, and so on. But as I said, perhaps because I didn't really know Jesus to begin with is what that was about. It wasn't about doing the works. It was about knowing our Lord and Savior. It was about having a real relationship. And, and again, I don't want to jump ahead of myself in this message, but that is what also happens in relationship with others that we, that we love in our lives. I'm going to get into that in a little bit here. So without the knowledge of who Jesus is, without understanding fully, you know, who we've fallen in love with, to fully appreciate, to appreciate what he'd done for us, uh, there's a disconnect. That's the problem. So the love then that we define, or what we define as love is really very superficial. It's, it's just skin deep. It's not, it doesn't go any further than that. You know, yes, it may be our first love, but, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have to lose our first love. And that's something I, I really want to stress. And this is going to be a hard pill to swallow, I think, for a lot of people. But we don't need to lose our first love. And I'll, again, that's going to make sense here in a little bit. You know, that love should be able to grow with the truth, especially as it relates to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Now this again is from the Bible Commentary, uh, and this is uh, from Volume 7. When the believer in the fellowship of the Spirit can lay his hand upon truth itself and appropriate it, he eats the bread that comes down from heaven. He enters into the life of Christ and appreciates the great sacrifice made in behalf of the sinful race. The knowledge that comes from God is the bread of life. It is the leaves of the tree of life which are for the healing of the nations. The current uh, of spiritual life thrills the soul as the words of Christ are believed and practiced. Think about that for a minute. You know, that initial excitement, that fervor, that enthusiasm. Thus it is that we are made one with Christ. The experience that was weak and feeble becomes strong. It is eternal life to us if we would hold the beginning of our confidence firm unto the end. All truth is to be received as the life of Jesus. Truth cleanses us from all impurity and prepares the soul for Christ's presence. Christ is formed within the hope of glory. So there you have it. I mean, that sums it up pretty well. But the journey through life today that characterizes our love for Jesus, especially and unfortunately in our own church, is often one of real superficiality. As I said, it's only skin deep. It's very, very superficial. It's external. It's not about the truth as it is in Jesus. It's about the forms of our faith, about the forms of our faith, not about the heart, not about what's in the heart. It's about ceremony and ritual not about a, a, a deep abiding love for our Savior. It's more that we're into the mechanics, the process. You know, this basically is a replay of ancient Israel's plight. It's exactly the same thing that we experience today. Think about it for a minute. They not only had the truth at, at that time, they witnessed the kind of events by the Lord that were just absolutely incredible, you know, that were done on their behalf. And nothing like what we would see today, certainly none of the great miracles that were witnessed by the children of Israel. And yet still, what happened? They lost their first love. You know, what went wrong? How did that happen? In the Bible, in Jeremiah 2, verse 2, the Bible says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. It's just, you know, imagine yourself for a minute standing there in the, with the multitude before the Red Sea with the Egyptians close pursuing, closely behind. And this great sea parts and, and you're able to walk through on dry ground and, and escape uh, the Egyptian pursuers. It's a sight that few of us could ever even imagine. I mean, it goes way beyond what we could ever imagine to know that God loves us so much that he would bring about an event that was such an incredible miracle to save us from certain destruction. You know, don't you think that this would engender a real love for the Lord? To know that he had done that for us? To save our lives? Think about that. You know, his illustration of love toward us it's a very, it's the very example of the love he asked us to have for each other. It's, it's, it's the example. That's the bottom line in 1 John 4, 19. And I think we all know this verse. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Now, but what happened with the Israelites was an example of, of unrequited love on an astronomically grand scale. It's just incredible. The Lord did all that for his children, and they just could not be obedient. They just lost the, the enthusiasm uh, for their Lord. They just lost that love. It actually became about self, and thanks to a leadership that re relied more on its own authority than on God's, it only got worse. Uh, again, Bible Commentary, Volume 4. As under David's rule, the people of Israel gained strength and uprightness through obedience to God's law. But the kings that followed strove for self-exaltation. They took to themselves glory for the greatness of the kingdom, forgetting how utterly dependent they were upon God. Keep that in mind. 
They regarded themselves as wise and independent because of the honor showed them by fallible, erring man. They became corrupt, immoral, and rebelled against the Lord, turning from him to the worship of idols. God bore long with them, calling them often to repentance, but they refused to hear, and at last God spoke in judgment, showing them how weak they were without him. He saw that they were determined to have their own way, and he gave them into the hands of their enemies who spoiled their land and took the people captive. The alliances made by the Israelites with their heathen neighbors resulted in the loss of their identity as God's peculiar people. They became leavened by the evil practices of those with whom they formed forbidden alliances. Affiliation with worldlings caused them to lose their first love and their zeal for God's service. The advantages they sold themselves to gain brought only disappointment and caused the loss of many souls. You know, just incredible. I mean, these, these examples and uh, what you find in this commentary, it, it, it applies to us in many cases today. Uh, and something for us to really give some thought to. Uh, you know, Ellen White goes on to describe God's unfailing love, and this is uh, in the Review and Herald, his unfailing love and the dilemma uh, that the Israelites faced. Sinful and rebellious, through the, the, though the children of Israel had been, the Lord had ever regarded them with compassion and by every possible means had tried to win them back to himself. When Israel was a child, the Lord declared, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt, Hosea 11.1. 1. He had led his chosen ones into the promised land and established them uh, there, where, <clears throat> there that they, they might be a blessing to the whole earth. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, he declared, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man with bands of love. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? Shall, how shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboim? My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I think it gives us some perspective on how the struggle the Lord himself had with his own children, and with certainly in this case with the, the children of Israel. And, and think about this for a minute how many analogies we can draw between that and also our relationship with others, maybe in a marriage, uh, maybe uh, family members, whatever the case may be. We feel hurt when we don't get back that feeling of love from them. We, I think all of us perceptively know when someone doesn't love us. Uh, I think we, we have that built into us, that if somebody says they love you, but you could sense, you can see that that's not, it's just words. It, it doesn't really amount to much. <clears throat> you know, just as the admonishments to ancient Israel uh, were, the, the, the uh, call to repentance was repeated to the church at Ephesus. It was repeated, and it extends, think about this, it extends to all of us today. And this is, again, uh, from Bible Commentary, Volume 4, God comes with entreaties and assurances to those who are making mistakes. He seeks to show them their error and lead them to repentance. But if they refuse to humble their hearts before him, if they strive to exalt themselves above him, he must speak to them in judgment. No semblance of nearness to God, no assertion of connection with him will be accepted from those who persist in dishonoring him by leaning upon the arm of worldly power. So again, people know, and certainly the Lord knows, when we're not sincere, when we're not, when we really don't have that, that enthusiasm, that fervor, that love that maybe we once had. Uh, I don't want to, you know, run that into the ground here, but, you know, this, throughout Scripture there are so many distinct examples on how those who occupied a role in leadership, and, and that's really significant, how they had lost their first love. They lost their first love, and as a result, they turned away from God, or they turned others away from God. You know, everyone knows the story of Samson, and that's a very good example, and he, he was truly a man of God. He was, you know, from his birth to adulthood, but his, uh, you know, his, his life at that time was dedicated to God. You know, everything he did 
for God from the moment he opened his eyes in the morning until the moment he went to bed. Those things were all for the Lord. But gradually over time, something happened. He started flirting with evil. And, and as a result, evil came into his life. Here's the, the, here's the, the startling bottom line that you're going to find in Scripture that describes this. This is from Judges chapter 16, verse 20. And he, Samson, awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He was going to go about business as usual, uh, but he had already gone off the track. And, and as a result of that, he, at that time, he didn't even realize that he had lost that, that the Lord had departed from him. So Samson became so unaware of his loss of, of his own love for God and so insensitive to God's presence that, that his, his spirit had left him and he didn't even know it. Then, of course, there's King Saul, and we all know that story real well. He started out with such great promise and what happened, as we all know, he gradually turned his back on God. Thus the result described in, in Scripture. And this is in 1 Samuel 15, verse 28. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. You know, the consequences can truly be unfortunate when we lose our first love. You know, not just our first love for the Lord, but our first love even in relationships with others. You know, when we stop putting God first and we rely on our own devices, not only do we run the risk of losing that relationship with the Lord, but we run the risk of losing our relationship maybe with a spouse or someone else in our life who's significant because we're not putting God first. You know, going back to the church of Ephesus, the story is in a sense the same as it is in our church today. It's really the same story. That's the interesting part. You know, they had a zeal for orthodoxy. They, you know, practiced, they, they were very much into the forms of their faith, but they had lost a genuine love for the Lord. They lost that love for Jesus, but they were busy doing the, the rituals and the ceremonies. They studied scripture. They vigorously debated the heretics. You know, but they lost their first love for the Lord in the process. And uh, that says a lot. You know, they stood against the evil in their midst, even though, uh, you know, severe trials and persecutions came, but they gradually and quietly acquiesced into an empty love for Jesus and even perhaps for each other. Unbelievable. You know, this unfortunately caused them to become entangled, you know, in false doctrines as a means of trying to prove or illustrate their love. And that happens, I think, with a lot of us. We get caught up in all other kind of things because we're trying in some way, maybe through externals, to show that we still have that love. We're still there, that it hadn't waned. But unfortunately, it's often not the case. And that's happening for many of us today. You know, Ellen White says it this way, and this is in the Acts of the Apostles. As early in the history of the church, the mystery of iniquity foretold by the Apostle Paul began its baleful work. And as the false teachers concerning whom Peter had warned the believers urged their heresies, many were ensnared by false doctrines. Some faltered under trial and were tempted to give up the faith. At the time when John was given this revelation, many had lost their first love of gospel truth. But in his mercy, God did not leave the church to continue in a backslidden state. In a message of infinite tenderness, he revealed his love for them and his desire that they should make sure work for eternity. Remember, he pleaded, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. You know, as I said, this is a message for all of us today. It should resonate with us as many in our, our, our church have lost their first love. Many of us in our lives have lost our first love. You know, now I wouldn't be honest with you, friends, if I said that, oh, I've always been on track. Uh, obviously, I'd shared a little about my way back in the past, but what about once I did finally become converted and had rekindled that love with Jesus? Has there been a point where maybe that love has waned a little bit, where I've struggled with it? Don't we all go through that? It, it has happened. It does happen. 
Sometimes we're faced with things in our lives, maybe with trials, uh, maybe, uh, you know, something happening in our, our relationship, in our marriage, uh, who knows what, but the point is, we somehow begin to lose that enthusiasm and that excitement. And we can't let that happen. Uh, we, we can't give that up. That's so vital that that doesn't happen to us. You know, as I, as I said, it's a message for all of us. But the Lord in His mercy, He allows us to experience the trials that come into our lives, that attempt to draw us, uh, you know, uh, it attempts to draw us back to Him because we have to rely on Him when these things happen. You know, we gain strength by relying on Him, and not only that, but we come to trust Him and know Him better and really have that bond and that connection. So if we lose the enthusiasm in our love for the Lord, can we honestly reach out and minister to others? Think about that. If we're struggling ourselves, are we going to be able to reach out to others with a gospel message? This is uh, from Matthew 5, verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Is it thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men? You know, I don't know about you, but I, I sure don't want to be good for nothing. <laughs> I'd like to be able to get a message out and uh, reach out to as many as possible with a message of truth. But if you don't love Jesus with a sincere love, well, your heart is really in it. How can you do that? How is that possible? Uh, I don't think it would be possible. We could go through the motions, but it's just not the same. You know, I'm sure you've heard the expression that was ad adopted into the vernacular, what's in a name? I, I like this, this is a good example. Is sometimes we're, we're merely just trying to uphold a name. Uh, we do that, you know, an image, uh, a name, uh, uh, but the love really isn't connected to it. And we'll say, I'm a Christian, or I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. But do we ha is it in name only? Is there love behind that? You know, it's just what Jesus admonished the, the scribes and the Pharisees about in Matthew 15, from verses 8 and 9. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You know, this is exactly what's happened, unfortunately, to so many in our churches. We're just going through the mechanics, the motions, but the heart is not there. And you're know, really good about profession of faith in those ceremonies and rituals. I mean, I think we're great at illustrating that, but are our hearts in it? And do we still have that first love? You know, or are we just going through those motions? This is, again, from the Bible Commentary, Volume 7. God calls upon this church to make a change. They had a name to live, but their works were destitute of the love of Jesus. Oh, how many have fallen because they trusted in their profession for salvation. Keep that, again, underscore that. Trusted in their profession for salvation. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. How many are lost by their effort to keep up a name? If one has the reputation of being a successful evangelist, a gifted preacher, a man of prayer, a man of faith, a man of special devotion, there is positive danger that he will make ship, a shipwreck of, his, of faith when tried by the little test that God suffers to come. Often his great effort will be to maintain his reputation. You know, perhaps many of us are trying to maintain a reputation by going through the mechanics of faith but we've lost the enthusiasm that characterized our first love. That's, that's what it's about. You know, just like the church of Ephesus, many in our church have stopped doing the first works. You know, we, we become mired down in the mechanics of faith to such a degree, uh, you know, that we even carry, uh, uh, we have things happen or come into our lives or into the church that carry us into deception and into apostasy because we've lost that, that, that firm grounding, that excitement, the, the truth that we had. This is again from Bible Commentary, Volume 7. The message to the Laodicean church is highly applicable to us as a people. It has been placed before us for a long time, but has not been heeded as it should have been. When the work of repentance is earnest and deep, 
the individual members of the church will buy the rich goods of heaven. Oh, how many behold things in a perverted light, in, in the light in which Satan would have them see. You may manifest great zeal in missionary effort, and yet because it is uh, corrupted with selfishness and tastes strongly of self, it is not in the sight of God, for it is tainted, a tainted, corrupted offering. Unless the door of the heart is open to Jesus, unless he occupies the soul temple, unless the heart is imbued with his divine attributes, human actions, when weighed in the heavenly balances, will be pronounced wanting. The love of Christ would make you rich, but many do not realize the value of his love. Many do not realize that the spirit which they cherish is destitute of the meekness and lowliness of Christ, destitute of the love that would constitute them channels of light. So the big question is, how did we get this way? What happened? How did we get to a point where we have so put aside or lost that ability to hang on to the first love as we describe it? You know, how did we wander away from a deep abiding love for the Lord and the earnest work that goes along with that? How did that happen? You know, we can certainly blame it on the deceptive teachings that have come into the church. Yeah, we can do that. You know, that would definitely be one factor. But, you know, after all, you know, many use their particular pet teaching, you know, I believe anyway, to show that maybe they know something that someone else doesn't. Uh, maybe somehow it's supposed to illustrate their faith uh, as a firm believer or a true believer. You know, maybe those things are a factor, but, you know, in a case like that, it's an empty faith. It's not about love. It's about doctrine and, and in this case, erroneous doctrines at best. And there are many of those teachings that have come into the church, and I won't get into that. I'll talk about that in another message. You know, I'll get into that another time. But, but let's look at the most prominent reason, the most prominent reason that we all too often lose our first love. Let's go back to marriage as an example in the world today. That's, that's the example. Many of us are aware that marriage between the bride and the bridegroom in Scripture represents the marriage between the Lord and His church. But it's also an illustration of the love that God intended between husband and wife. We see that. This is from uh, Councils for the Church. <clears throat> marriage, a union, for, a union for life, is a symbol of the union between Christ and His church. The spirit that Christ manifests toward the church is the spirit that husband and wife are to manifest toward each other. You know, ideally, a true first love for our potential partner should be the only love. Now, most people are going to say, oh, no, no, that, that's not right. We all have this first love experience in our lives. But assuming we know who someone really is, that so-called first love should be the love. And it certainly applies to our Lord and Savior. But that's the problem. In our world today, we don't often spend enough time finding out you know, what the object of our affections or who the object of our affections is all about. We don't spend enough time doing that. We don't really know that person. You know, maybe we think we do. Uh, that's the problem. That perhaps we make a mistake and we just write it off as being our, our first love. It's a first love experience. But this carries with it some really serious uh, repercussions. It really does. Uh, I don't think we want to minimize the significance of our first love experience, you know, because it can ultimately characterize what happens to our relationship with Jesus. It will reflect on that. And this is again from Bible Commentary, Volume 2. One of the greatest dangers that besets the people of God today is that of association with the ungodly, especially in uniting themselves in marriage and uh, with unbelievers. With many, with many, <coughs> excuse me, the love for the human eclipses the love for the divine. They take the first step in backsliding by venturing to disregard the Lord's express command and complete apostasy is too often the result. It has ever proved a dangerous thing for men to carry out their own will in opposition to the requirements of God. Yet it is a hard lesson for men to learn that God means what he says. As a rule, those who choose for their friends and companions, persons who reject Christ and trample upon God's law, eventually become of the same mind and spirit. We should ever feel a deep interest in the salvation of the impenitent and should manifest toward them a spirit 
of kindness and courtesy, but we can safely choose for our friends only those who are the friends of God. The biggest problem in our society today is that it takes an almost tongue-in-cheek look at the first love experience. It's incredible. You know, we're taught both, you know, overtly and subliminally that it's okay to get beyond that first love experience, to just forget it and move on, just, just leave it behind. Let's just get over, get over it. But it raises two obvious questions. You know, was it really love in the first place? That'd be the first obvious question. You know, love as the Bible defines it anyway. Uh, you know, if we claim it was or it could have been, you know, was it based on a true knowledge of that person? Did we really know who that person was? You know, if it follows that by beholding we become changed, then the way our society views the first love experience has a big influence on how we see our relationship with Jesus. It, it, it influences us, whether it's on a subliminal level or whether we just go along with, with the program that people put out there. You know, just take a look at some of what's out there in the media that help to illustrate this perspective. <clears throat> Here's an article in Psychology Today. Is love really essential to marriage? <laughs> I like this one, really incredible. If you read some of this, it goes on. that The notion that love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage is still widespread but the arguments against it are gaining strength, and it goes on from there. I mean, we have a society now that's putting down even the idea of having a bond, a love between people as being part of marriage. <clears throat> Here's an article, Beware of Men Who Never Get Over a First Love. Well, maybe they shouldn't have gotten over the first love because the first love should have been the love that they had, but what went wrong there? I mean, I, we can get into a lot of reasons that sometimes people have disagreements and whatever, and we, we can go there, but the point is if we're going to call it love, it's the first love, it should be the only and always love, just like with us and Christ. How to recover your faith when you feel like you've lost it. There's a lot coming out in the media about this now. It's a, it's a big deal. This is, these are all recent articles, by the way. Oh, I like this one. <clears throat> Life's short, get a divorce. There's a, a billboard actually in the Chicago area that outraged people because it was so, uh, so out there. You know, life's short, get a divorce. Yeah, let's, let's just throw that marriage away. But here's the subject that a lot are becoming enthralled with right now. How do you recapture your first love for God? How do you recapture it? Here's a Hillsong writer, I'm genuinely losing my faith. These are big, you know, stars either in Christian music or country and Western music. A lot of articles like this recently. I was a hardcore Christian, but this is why I lost my faith. Uh, Lauren Daigle says her new album will explain why she lost her religion, uh, Embrace Joy of Faith. Another pop culture Christian loses his faith. It just goes on. There's a slew of these articles out there. Millennials losing faith in God, a survey shows. Very interesting. Talks about uh, this one here from the Christian Post, what parents can do when college students lose faith. So again, there's this big issue of losing faith. How do we lose it? How do we lose that love for the Lord? How do we know that that's, that's happened? So, you know, how do you know that you've lost your first love? Here's some signs to look for. This is how you know you've lost your first love. You make excuses for doing things that displease the Lord. I think a lot of us do that. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm sure there's times I've been guilty of that myself. You're no longer excited about studying God's Word or praying. You delight in someone or something else more than the Lord. The thoughts you have in leisure moments don't honor God. They don't honor the Lord. You no longer treat others with kindness and understanding. You view God's commandments as burdensome or restrictive. You no longer give to God's work or to the needs of others. You strive for kudos or recognition from the world instead of approval from God. And you're unwilling to forgive others. I think that's a, that's a really big one, too. You know, think about it. You know, <laughs> there was a time when David felt he had drifted away from God, that David himself had drifted away. And uh, we see that, oops, in uh, Psalms. And this is from chapter 51, verses 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me 
with thy free spirit. You know, obviously David repented and went on to serve God the rest of his life. You know, but friends, we could certainly do the same. We can certainly do the same. If we find ourselves in a situation where we've just kind of given up, you know, maybe we've, it seems like we've, we've lost that enthusiasm, we don't have to lose our first love. And, and if you feel this is happening in your life, you can get it back with just a little effort. You know, not only your love for Jesus, but the love for your spouse. Uh, the Bible says in Psalms 51, verses 10 through 12, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. You know, obviously David repented, and he went on to serve God the rest of his life. You know, we can do the same thing. There's no reason why we couldn't. We don't have to lose our first love. And if you feel that's happening in your life, you know, you can get it back with just a little bit of effort. You know, not only your love for Jesus, but your love for your, your, your spouse, your partner in your life. This is from Councils for the Church. Affection may be as clear as crystal and, and beauteous in its purity, yet it may be shallow because it has not been tested and tried. Make Christ first and last and best in everything. Constantly behold him, and your love for him will daily become deeper and stronger as it is submitted to the test of trial. And as your love for him increases, your love for each other will grow deeper and stronger. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. You now have duties to perform that before your marriage you did not have. <clears throat> Put on, therefore, kindness, <clears throat> humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Give careful study to the following instruction. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands and as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the, the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So again, this is good counsel on what we can do maybe a little bit differently in our perspective and how we're able to overcome that lo potential loss of the first love. You know, if you're struggling because you feel you've lost your way in your marriage or in your relationship with Jesus, you know, just know that you're not alone there. You know, we've all had times in our lives where, where that's happened. You know, don't give up. Don't ever give up. You'll find that it's possible to rekindle those relationships and you'll wind up falling in love again. This is uh, from 1 John 4, verses 16 and 17. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. You know, there are those who say it's difficult or impossible for human beings uh, to be in a loving, monogamous relationship, that it's just not possible to do that for their entire life. Can't be done. And sadly, many marriages are dissolving for that very reason. They're getting shorter and shorter, especially in this current generation. But there are those, believe it or not, who have remained happily married well over half a century or even longer, many, many decades and uh, I leave you with these stories about the world's longest marriages. These are, this is fascinating to me. It's uh, from the Daily Mail, an article, record-breaking grandfather who was married to his wife for 91 years after an arranged wedding, an arranged wedding in 1925, dies at the age of 110. Nice elderly, there's the couple, amazing couple, absolutely amazing. The longest married couple still happy since eloping in 1932. Incredible. And then this one I really like. It's a marriage that broke a, a world record. You know, and their se secret is simple. Again, these are uh, passed away recently. But in each case, when they were asked, you know, what was the secret? You know, what kept them living happily together for so long? The answer was always trust and commitment. It's just amazing. Here's a quote from Mr. and Mrs. Fisher, who you're seeing here. They died at 105 years old each. 
This is a, a quote from them. When asked about the best piece of marriage advice to give to others, this is what they said. Respect, support, and communicate with each other. Be faithful, honest, and true. Love each other with all your heart. Where have we heard that before? Love each other with all your heart. It's from the Bible, Jeremiah 29, 13, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So if we do that, if we truly want to know God, if we truly want to have that relationship, we can have it. We can have a love that endures, just like that 105-year-old couple. You know, it is possible. It's absolutely possible. You know, uh, don't ever give up. There's hope. Even in the worst case, where you feel like everything's falling apart, you know, your marriage is struggling, you, you, you just can't seem to find that enthusiasm anymore for what you had before when it came to things of, of the Lord. You know, it's going to church, ministering to others, just feeling, taking, even taking the time to pray. You can get it back. I think we've seen that from some of the examples we've looked at, but most important of all, if you can do those things, if you could emulate with some of these people who have lasted in marriages for, for over, uh, you know, nearly a century, and you know, just about in some cases, you can have that and you can restore even the most difficult loss that you've had in relationship with Jesus and it will last you literally the rest of your life. That's what we all strive for. This idea of a first love and getting beyond it, no. I don't think that works, and especially not with our relationship with the Lord. If we can just continue to, to seek Him out, to learn more about Him, and to remember it is possible to hold on to that love. Never give up. Hold on to that thought as you go through your day today.